just want to say welcome to everyone. Um, we are really excited about this day. We're so thrilled to be able to be honoring you today, Dr. Weber. It's been a really tremendous couple of years where we've been talking and thinking about this. So it's really awesome. And welcome, everyone, for coming and braving the, the snow and cold out there. Um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Barb Losoff. I'm the Life Sciences Librarian here. And I'm also part of what we would call, affectionately, we've called ourselves Team Weber. Uh, there's, there's some folks here and I'll be introducing them. But I just wanted to take a moment to kind of give you an idea how this all got started. And some of it had to do with working on digitizing the University of Colorado um, C Studies uh, series in biology, which is a 1950s, 1960s publication. And Dr. Weber's name kept coming up in those publications. His works were in there. And so we were working on digitizing it, and I, I kind of wanted to know the history of the publishing, and no one could answer these questions. And so I was starting to develop questions for Dr. Weber. So um, then after that, I was encouraged to go down into archives and to look into the Cockrell papers, which again brings me right back to Dr. Weber. <laughs> so um, all of these things combined, I then started to think that oral histories are really something important and that libraries should be looking to do that for um, the institutional memory. And at the same time as all this was going on, Andrew Violet, who's here as well, and I'll be introducing him, he's in programming and communications. Um, he and Deborah Fink, who's also the, the head of that department, were talking about you know, who would be their next um, CU Libraries legend. And they had already identified you, Dr. Weber, which was really interesting. So then Andrew and I put our heads together and started to say, well, we're just gonna try to contact you, and that's what we did. And we had many a wonderful conversation at restaurants, at your house, um, special collections where we were videotaping um, the conversations. And then um, Tim Hogan and Aaron Tripp were so gracious. We, of course, the herbarium played a very important part in all of this. And we were over there and did an interview with the family as well was there. So we really have had a great time. It's been a marvelous journey. And just thank you so much for everything you've done. And this is for you. We're, we're going to have a few speakers here today. Um, there will be three different speakers. We have a film that is just incredible. I've got to tell you that Lewis, you, who has been with us and came to all the interviews, put together a film, and then we're gonna, of course, have the man, as your daughter said, the man of the century, rather than the <laughs> man of the day. So that's how it's gonna go here today. And so I'd like to go ahead, and before we get started, one more time I wanna do um, a, an idea of, or to give you an idea of the Team Weber group. And so I would like to say that these are the folks who, who worked really hard, the hub of the wheel, but we relied on so many people to do this work. And um, you know, we created the narrative. This is the, the exhibit that's downstairs, the film, all those pieces. So I'd like to introduce to you um, Andrew Violet, who will be coming up here in just a moment. Um, then there's also Rebecca Kuglich, who I hope is here. There she is. She's our interdisciplinary science librarian. And she's not been here that long, but she jumped into this project, which was really great. Um, we have Lewis Zeller. And where is Lewis? There he is behind the camera. He's our film studies student. We are very fortunate that he uh, graduated and came back just this Monday as a full-time position here in um, media services. Um, and then Deborah Fink is also here somewhere. She's all the way in the back. And um, she's been our, our communications and outreach librarian for, for many years here. And did I get everybody? Anybody else? Okay, and Andrew was just gonna come up real quick before we introduce the speaker. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Uh, I just wanna give a, a quick shout out to my boss and mentor, the uh, director of the Programming and Communications Department, Deborah Fink. She's been in that position for over 30 years here in the library. She's gonna be retiring in about six weeks. And she has believed in the value of the CU Legend series since we began it honoring our elders and the pillars upon which this institution is really built. And uh, I just want to acknowledge her contribution and support uh, that's been tireless and excellent for that. So.
Okay, and now we'll start with our speakers, and I would really like to uh, welcome here Jim Williams, the Dean of the Libraries. He has some words to say. Some of you saw me approach this room with this box. I'm a little tender. On my way up here, I suffered a massive nosebleed. And so if I don't make it through this, which is very important to me, my senior associate dean, Leslie Reynolds, sitting to my right, <laughs> is going to take over for me, and I will exit. But good afternoon, and I want to thank you all for joining us here today as we recognize one of CU's treasures, legendary Dr. William A. Weber. Let me start by providing a background on the University Library's CU Legends series. This series was established to highlight exceptional CU teachers and scholars whose contributions have lasting impact within the discipline, the campus, and the community. As stewards of the institutional memory and part of the larger scholarly conversation, the libraries are a natural fit for this series. After identifying faculty members for this distinction, the libraries collaborate with campus colleagues to create an exhibit and organize an event to feature the career of the contributions of the legend. The Friends of the Libraries that organization has supported this series with generous contributions for printing the exhibit posters, which I hope you have all seen. They're beautiful. Thank you, Andrew. Where is he? Thank you, Andrew. Since its inception in 2010, the CU Libraries Legends series has included Omer C. Stewart, anthropologist at CU from 1945 to 1974, a recognized authority on Native American cultures. Joe Ben Wheat, archaeologist and curator for the University of Colorado Museum of Natural History from 1953 to 1988, an expert on Southwest archaeology and textiles, and most recently, Hazel Barnes, classics, philosophy, and humanities professor at CU from 1953 to 1986, best known for her translation of Jean-Paul Sartre's being and nothingness. In the process of making the CU Library series, we've discovered some interesting parallels. For example, all four of the CU legends knew each other. They attended the same parties. Parties, Bill? <laughs> and the same church. And they participated in the same campus activities. All four were profoundly affected by World War II. Profoundly affected by World War II. And they are all socially progressive people with humanist, with humanist leanings. Dr. William A. Weber is our fourth honoree, as you know. 
It has been said that great institutions are created by great scholars. With that in mind, how appropriate that today we honor Bill as our next CU legend. Bill embodies all, all of the elements of a CU legend. His work has contributed to the discipline. With his numerous publications, he has elevated the university's recognition in the building of a world-class herbarium. And through the Colorado Flora series, he has contributed to our understanding of the plant life of Colorado. He brought his knowledge of Colorado flora to the world, while at the same time, he found the world represented in Colorado flora. He's an international figure. He generously hosted scholars from all over the globe and was a mentor to many. He has enriched our community through his ethic of citizen science and his belief that natural science is for everyone. He even donated to our special collections library an 11 book series on the travels of the protégés of Linnaeus, who collected and documented all they encountered on their explorations. After reading their accounts, Bill said, and I quote, as I relished each volume, as I relished each volume, at how their lives and ours are braided together, I marveled. Dr. Bill Weber is a part of that continuum, reminding us all of those who came before us and mentoring those who are in our future. Bill, we honor you today. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Jim. That was terrific. Um, so I'd like to introduce our second speaker here. It's going to be Pat Kaselik, uh, Director of the Museum of Natural History here at CU. First, before, so I'd like to also uh, thank a few people. Jim, you and your staff have been fantastic in developing the series and acknowledging, and I feel like maybe the series was developed to acknowledge uh, Museum of Natural History faculty and curators, <laughs> with two of the four coming from the museum, so that's, uh, that's wonderful, but um, Andrew and Barb and everyone associated with thank you and your staff so much for a really wonderful um, uh, progression as this has moved forward and a wonderful evening this evening. I've, uh, I've been asked to talk about Bill as a naturalist. And so, um, so what is a naturalist? It's usually somebody who goes out to nature to study the plants and animals there in their uh, element. And, um, and uh, Louis Agassiz, back in the 1800s, had a really wonderful statement about uh, how naturalists work. And he instructed them to go to nature, take the facts into your own hands, look and see for yourself. And that really does embody a lot of what Bill's work has been since he was a young man, since he was a boy, actually, walking to school, uh, taking a notebook with him, copiously taking notes, making drawings of the birds he saw, information that still informs science, actually, as people are understanding what were the birds in New York City at that time. Bill has a wonderful document to share with people about it. And of course, in his professional life as a botanist, um, going out into nature, studying the plants in, in nature has been a hugely important part of his work. Um, 
And um, there are a number of reasons why we might think of Bill as a legend. I'm, there, I'm sure we all have our own reasons we could come up here and talk about. But of course, professionally, I'd like to say first, uh, uh, staying power, right? A legend has been at it for some time. Bill's been associated with the University of Colorado in a paid capacity for over 40 years, and as emeritus professor and curator for 20, nearly 25 years in addition. So, um, and he is, as, as Jim mentioned, participating in campus life, the life of our community here in Boulder, the life uh, of, of botany nationally and internationally as well. But he's been at it a long time. And um, the other thing that you should know, we, we use the term botany or plants, but the breadth of Bill's knowledge is unbelievable related to these organisms. So, uh, you know, we live in a day where we're, we're with hyper specialists, you know, to study the diatoms of this little, small, little group of things. Bill's expertise is not only in, well, I can't use the words higher plant, bigger plants, angiosperms, but he also studied, he has studied and, and written on bryophytes, mosses and liverworts and things like that, but also lichens, which, include, which, are, which are a symbiosis of algae and fungi. So it's almost like, an, you know, it's the whole, bot, the whole world of botany, algae, fungi, liverworts, bryophytes, and higher plants. And he has technical expertise and, and, uh, and knowledge in that wide spectrum of taxonomic breadth. And as, as Jim mentioned, he's also got tremendous breadth geographically. Of course, we know, many of us know him for his work here in Colorado, whether it's up in the mountains or on the plains or in the, in the west, but he's also an expert on the uh, lichen forest of Scandinavia. He has also worked on, uh, in Asia, knows the Asian floor and its influence uh, here in Colorado. And take all that and then add Galapagos to it and a tremendous amount of breadth in terms of geography as well. So to know that, to know all, and to publish, to have that knowledge, to publish on that breadth of organisms over that geographic space is really you know, remarkable in and of itself. But Bill also decided he would share that knowledge not only with the scientific community, all those books and papers that he's published, but conservation community public policy makers, students that he trained and mentored, and the general public here in Boulder and further afield. That is just an unbelievable audience to have and be able to speak to because they're very different audiences. How you talk about technical botany to another systematic botanist versus how you work with a, a, a policy planner here in Boulder about green space and things like that. So. Um, and as a, as, a, as a legend, you get honored in lots of ways. This exhibit and this, this program here is one of them. But he has honors that are here in Boulder, uh, statewide, national, and international honors that have been bestowed upon him. Uh, in botany and in science, one of the best honors you can have is to have something named after you. He's had uh, two genera of higher plants named after him and over 40 other plants that have been named in his honor as well. Some other ways that uh, somebody might acknowledge the work is to uh, name something after you, but not be a plant or an animal, but an endowment. Ken and Ruth Wright, who are here, and named an endowment in honor of Bill for his contributions, which supports training young people in natural history. It's endowed over at the Natural History Museum, and it's a really wonderful honor for Bill uh, to keep that, uh, that, that uh, tradition of instilling people, that young people an understanding of, of being a naturalist. So, um, but I have to say in all of that, as we sit here in the library, as the director of the museum and as a scientist myself, the papers are great, the communication's great, uh, all of that's great, but the establishment of the herbarium is really, in my view, will be Bill's lasting legacy. So uh, if you can imagine arriving here where there was really no herbarium. A couple thousand plants were here to build that into a international collection of uh, renown, over half a million objects in that herbarium from Colorado, from right here in Boulder, to uh, Scandinavia, to the world's best collection of lichens in Galapagos. Uh, I think in the long run, that will, will serve as the test of time. There are people in this room who managed that herbarium well, Tim Hogan and Dina Clark, collection managers that uh, 
really take care of that, and we'll um, make sure that that stewardship of this wonderful thing that Bill's uh, produced for science, for, for CU, for botanical community, for a wide variety of users, um, that will stand the test of time in my view. The next person who will come up and speak to you is, so what's a herbarium like today? Why, is it modern, is it useful? Who would, who would make use of such a thing? We've got half a million things over there, but are they important to a new generation of scientists, a new generation of policymakers, a new generation of learners about the, the natural world and plant sciences? And am I gonna introduce Dr. Tripp? I think I have. So um, <laughs> Dr. Erin Tripp is the new uh, botanist in the herbarium, and uh, her work is based in uh, plant sciences based on specimens. We still look at specimens, and uh, she's going to be she's going to share with you why this herbarium is important for new generations of, of individuals. Bill, congratulations! It's a wonderful honor that this, the library is bestowing upon you and the friends of the library, and a legend in every sense of the word. Congratulations. Slanted, I can't put my water down. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for coming, braving the cold. <clears throat> so, as Pat mentioned, I'm going to say several words about a herbarium, but I got started by thinking about the question, which is what makes a legend? And so we'll see if I can try to answer that over the next 10 minutes or so. So, a legend is someone who has the foresight to build a collection, not just for current science, but a collection that will facilitate science of the future. Dr. Weber spent 60 years amassing a collection composed not only of Colorado plants, but of course from numerous areas of the world with botanical aff affinities to Colorado. And while the genetic tools available to him and his students at the time were insufficient to address major hypotheses in biology, he knew there would come a day when such barriers would no longer exist. And today, in fact, we have those tools available to test hypotheses that Dr. Weber spent his career developing and championing, hypotheses regarding, specifically, affinities between the Colorado alpine flora and alpine areas of East Asia, such as the Altai Mountains. Specifically, Dr. Weber picked up where Joseph Dalton Hooker, in a letter 1878 written to Charles Darwin, left off. Dr. Weber posited that our shared montane floras are ancient, were at one time more contiguous over a broader area of North America and Northern Asia, and that modern day distributions can be explained by a once contiguous flora that has subsequently become fragmented. Lucky am I and lucky are all of us associated with the Colorado Herbarium to have two new PhD students who are both actively pursuing origins as well as the future of the Colorado alpine flora. One student, Matt Sharples, using genetic data to explore relationships, evolutionary relationships between plants here and plants there. And another student, Melinda Markin, using ecological niche modeling techniques to predict future distributions of rare and many of them endangered alpine plants. Dr. Weber's foresight and facilitation of next generation science, all made possible by the collections he amassed in the herbarium, has finally come to pass. So a legend is someone who sees total value in a resource and not just the pieces that interest him or her specifically. Dr. Weber understood the collective value of all specimens that he accessioned into the Colorado Herbarium, whether they be minute plants restricted to the tundra or the alpine, or a vast diversity of difficult to identify grasses characteristic of our vast plains and prairies, one of the most fertile ecosystems of the world, or roadside weeds of Boulder County or Jefferson County. Dr. Weber recognized that herbaria are like tree rings, except for one difference. Guess? 
Instead of recording the history of only a single species, herbaria record the history of thousands of species. How many species are preserved in the Colorado herbarium? Dr. Weber? Oh, that's just you? Yeah. <laughs> Any guesses? <laughs> I think we have maybe 6,000 or so species. It's just a wild guess, but we can fight about it afterwards if anybody disagrees. <laughs> So 6,000 species, the herbarium serves as a record of biological history for thousands of species, a record of that species in time and in space. A herbarium record records what a given population of plants was doing at a given time and what the environmental or the biological or even social conditions reflecting human activities that population was experiencing. For example, <clears throat> Herbarium specimens record whether the winter of 1967, two decades after Dr. Weber landed at CU, was unseasonably long and cold, for such climatological conditions are, are reflected in late flowering of hundreds, tens to hundreds of species. This is really popular science right now, by the way. A lot of people are using herbarium data to do this. Very important information. So that's to say herbaria have a lot to teach us, not just about botany, not just about taxonomy, but about climatology and earth history. What else? Herbarium specimens record whether and when all the ponderosa pine trees across Boulder Mountain parks had a mass seed year in which a significant excess of pine seeds were produced only in one year and irregularly across intervening years as a reproductive strategy to cope with its natural beetle predators. Satiate and deceive, satiate and deceive, that's the strategy of mast seeding. That is to say, herbaria have a lot to teach us about ecology, not just botany and taxonomy. Herbarium specimens record what atmospheric composition looked like when Captains Meriwether Lewis and Clark barely survived a freezing winter, crossing the low, low pass in the Bitter Mountains, June, July, 1876. No food for horses for three days. The men finishing the last of their dried meat, surviving off of, anybody know? What were they surviving off of when they had nothing left? It made them really sick for months. Huh? Sagan? Chemicia, death chemists, that's exactly right. The Native Americans could cope with it, but the, the white guys just, uh, they actually got better through time. They started to acquire whatever natural bacteria flora allowed them to digest these very, very toxic plants. Um, but at first it was a struggle. So herbaria specimens record what those atmospheric conditions were like, and that's because this is preserved via carbon isotopes sequestered deep within the cellular content of herbarium specimens. So, in fact, we know that based on Lewis and Clark specimens in the Philadelphia herbarium, <clears throat> that levels of the carbon isotope 12 were much higher then than they are now, which is a direct reflection of the pristine, pre-industrial, um, unpolluted atmosphere, um, unpolluted by the burning of fossil fuels that Lewis and Clark journeyed through. So, that's to say that herbaria have a lot to teach us about human history as well. Herbarium specimens enable hundreds of other applications, some of which we've only begun to discover, and many of which we won't discover for 50 years or more. From a currently housed specimen right over here in Clare Small, we can extract and examine the DNA of an individual that grew two decades before Dr. Weber was born, in rarer cases, we can remove a 300-year-old acorn from a herbarium sheet, grow it up in cultivation, and look to see what kind of environment this 300-year-old genome was adapted to. Surely a different environment than those oak trees are adapted to today. From a single leaf of a herbarium specimen collected in post-World War II Japan, we can extract and explore 30 or 40 species that comprise that leaf's microbiome, fungal microbiome. Or we can thin section the leaf to study its cellular contents and architecture. 
We can use multiple collections of a species to accurately map geographic ranges or track the introduction and spread of invasive species. That is to say that herbaria have a lot to teach us about what it means to be an entire reference library. So much more than just botany and taxonomy. Finally, a legend is someone who sees beauty and value in very fine detail. Dr. Weber well understood the importance, not just of our flowering plant biota, but our lichen and our bryophyte biota as well. Lichens, as Pat mentioned, a symbiotic microcosm between a fungus and an alga, and who knows what else is growing inside of that. Um, bryophytes, those are the mosses, the liverworts, and the hornworts that cover rocks, soils, tree bark in tremendous abundance all across the world. Those two groups comprise ecologically significant groups of organisms that are traditionally neglected in many or even most herbaria. In fact, no other single herbarium in the United States has as high of a ratio of lichens and bryophytes to flowering plants as does the CU herbarium. Maybe in the world, I would take a guess. Thus, Dr. Weber's vision was inclusive and was carefully executed. He understood that when we're done inferring biogeography and taxonomy, ecology and evolution and human history from flowering plants, then we can move on to tell the story from the perspective of other organisms. That is to say, herbaria have a lot to teach us about the world, big and small, from towering cottonwoods to the brilliant hues given off by not one, not two, but 17 different species of lichen inhabiting a single rock in the Indian Peaks Wilderness or the Boulder Mountain Parks. So in addition to facilitating research, the herbarium plays a vital role in training and education. Hundreds of school children, undergraduates, graduate students pass through our stacks on an annual basis. The Colorado Herbarium is used to train US Forest Service staff members, interns on how to identify rare plants or invasive species. Farmers bring in samples of cheatgrass or smooth brome or other noxious weeds detrimental to ecosystem function for identification. Professionals across the world understand the value, well understand the value of the Colorado Herbarium. When I was offered this job, I was inundated by messages from colleagues breathing sighs of relief that such a collection of worldwide importance would be in the hands of a set of staff members. Shout out to Tim Hogan, our collections, one of our collections manager, Dina Clark. Can you, all of you guys associated with the herbarium stand up for a moment? So a set of staff members being Tim Hogan and Dina Clark, our two collections managers, Ryan Allen, um, the digitization project manager, myself, our many, many student helpers who value and use and care for the herbarium. We are all caretakers and historians. We're students, we're researchers, we're janitors, we're financial managers, we're administrators and volunteers, exhibitors and educators, all with the goal of learning from and preserving a multi-use resource. A reference library whose potential we have yet to fully realize, maybe we never will, built solely by the hands of a legend, someone who has written a very long, very important history, Dr. William Weber. Thank you, Dr. Weber, for a lifetime of contributions. Thank you so much, Aaron. That was just terrific, and uh, Pat as well. Thank you. Um, we are now just going to go to a film here that Lewis Zeller, who's there, could you want to stand, Lewis, uh, created, and it's called The Naturalist, and it's it's you, it's your life, and Dean Williams has narrated, and thank you so much for that. Um, you'll be able to recognize his voice. It's wonderful. Oh, 
the electronic age. Well, that was really, uh, it took us all through your life. It was really pretty incredible. So now we're ready to hear from you, uh, the man of the century, the CU Libraries legend, Dr. William A. Weber. couple of things I want to congratulate some other people. Right, before, before all of this goes on. Uh, I was a, I was a part-time actor in the early 50s. I was the superb character art, actor of the Nomad Players. I was Corporal Schultz in Stalag 17. <laughs> You don't eat, you don't have duty, you got it good. I was Kalenkov, the music, the dancing master, and you can't take it with you. Boxed, Diaghilev, then you had the ballet. You might get stomach ulcers. My cousin had stomach ulcers. <laughs> And I was a charter member of the, the festival chorus. And uh, having grown up in New York, I was blessed by the fact of being born during the Great Depression when everything was cheap. Nobody had jobs, but they had time to mentor kids. And it was wonderful. Now, when I was in high school, I had an English teacher. I remember my teachers. I don't remember, remember what I learned, <laughs> but I remember the good teachers. I had an English teacher who read us Chaucer in the original. Uh, I'm a voracious reader. I have finished the second volume of Mark Twain recently, as you will understand. Um, in the audience, there's one person who re remembers that one of our favorite neighbors used to call me Father William. And one of the poems that my teacher in English taught us was, You Are Old Father William. And I think that this is, a par this is a parody of a poem written by, who, what was his name? I have a terrible time with these names. Oh yeah, it was Robert Southey. This was a parody, as you know, if you read lots of, of uh, Lewis Carroll's things, that he wrote parodies in his books. And Robert Southey wrote a poem called The Old Man's Comfort. And he was poet laureate in Victorian England. And he was in 1813 uh, honored for that. I thought I'd read this to you. You ought to get back into this. This Carol business of old, old, wonderful parodies. You are old, Father William, the young man said, and your hair has become very white, and yet you incessantly stand on your head. Do you think at your age it is right? <laughs> In my youth, Father William replied to his son, I feared it might injure the brain. But now that I'm perfectly sure I have none, why, I do it again and again. <laughs> you are old, said the youth, as I mentioned before, 
and have grown most uncommonly fat. Yet you turned a back somersault in at the door. Pray, what is the reason for that? In my youth, said the sage, as he shook his gray locks, I kept all my limbs very supple. By the use of this ointment, one shilling a box. Allow me to sell you a couple. You are old, said the youth, and your jaws are too weak for anything tougher than suet. Yet you finished the goose with the bones and the beak. Pray, how did you manage to do it? In my youth, said the father, I took to the law and argued each course case with my wife. And the muscular strength that it gave to my jaw has lasted the rest of my life. <laughs> you are old, said the youth. One would hardly suppose that your eye was as steady as ever. Yet you balanced an eel at the end of your nose. What made you so awfully clever? I have answered three questions. That is enough, said his father. Don't give yourself airs. Do you think I could listen all day to that stuff? Be off. I'll kick you downstairs. <laughs> And that is it.